Hello, I think we are ready to start today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Sanford Burnham Previous Medical Discovery Institute for our inside lectures. My name is Max Disposti. I am the founder executive director of the North San Diego County LGBTQ Resource Center. And it is my honor today to moderate this insight here with our doctors from the Sanford Burnham Previous and community members. The insight is a special lecture series where you get a chance to learn about research and ask some questions the SBP, um, to the SBP scientists. As many of you know, SBP conducts foundations research to identify the building blocks of biology, human health processes, and disease. We, regards, we research into cancer, heart disease, aging, neurodegenerative diseases, and, and much more. So it is my honor today to present um, uh, doctors and community members that are going to have um, a conversation around HIV cure, where the research is, where the hopes is and are, and so that we can all a little bit understand about um, the road to, uh, to, to take and also answer some questions from community members that they are here today. So again, thank you for joining us. Our first um, presenter today is a community member and a dear friend, Rafael Rubalcaba. Um, Rafael is an HIV uh, supportive uh, service specialist at Advantage Healthcare Services here in North San Diego County in Orange County. He has worked in the HIV field for the past 17 years, providing expertise and services throughout Southern California. Rafael has a background in HIV case management, including HIV treatment, prevention, testing, education, and advocacy. I also had the pleasure to work with Rafael for many years here as a community member in assisting and supporting people affected, infected by HIV, but also through educating the community and in around stigma and biases when it comes to um, um, HIV prevention and cure and, 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 and you know, in support. Um, Rafael, no further ado, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Max, nice being here. Hi, you guys. Um, my name is Rafael Rualcaba, and like Max said, I have been in the community for many, many years helping uh, um, my fellow uh, HIV positive uh, community. Uh, that's what I, um, that's what I strive for, is to help one another. Uh, I always tell people if, uh, not that the service wasn't there when I was diagnosed in 1996, but um, I didn't have the, the, the hand holding and the care that I actually give my patients that I help out. Everything from, you know, setting them up to a doctor's appointment to getting them there um, to offering, you know, uh, discussions uh, late at night to talk to them when they're worrying about, you know, is my viral load uh, going to go up if I do this or whatnot. So, I'm just there to help the community out in any way I can. Um, like Max said, we worked together uh, at the beginning when uh, the LGBT Center was founded and we thought it very important to have an HIV component and services. So we actually had a um, support group there at the LGBT Center, which was actually very, very popular um, at North in the North County of San Diego. Um, uh, in the bio, it really makes me feel kind of old because, you know, it's working in this field for 17 years. But um, when you love the work you do, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. Uh, for myself, you know, um, I, I would be considered a long-term survivor of HIV, uh, having it for over 25 years. And um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like it anymore. But I want uh, anybody who's watching this to remember that um, because of the research that's going on and uh, the research that continues to go on till this day, actually, uh, that we might actually have a glimpse in our lifetime, excuse me, uh, to have a cure. And uh, I'm especially honored to be on this panel. Uh, thank you, Max, for inviting me and the rest of the panel's uh, members. Uh, and it's really, a, uh, it's really a great honor. Hopefully, I'll be asking some questions that my fellow HIV um, uh, men and women out in the community uh, might be able to 
uh, so they can understand a little bit more about where we come from. Thank you, Max. Thank you so much, Rafael. And you know, just diving right into, I didn't mean to 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 age you, <laughs> but we're both on the same side of this history. I think. Um, what do you think, for instance, every time that throughout history there has been an attempt to approach HIV care or HIV cure, you know, there's a lot, a lot of sometimes, you know, uh, concerns, you know, from our community, you know, the fear to touch something that is working, because I, for the people that are watching, as we know right now, we don't have a cure for HIV, but definitely um, we've been able to stabilize and people can live healthy lives as long as they take care of themselves. So there is not a cure, but a lot of people have found, you know, renewed happiness and stability and health as well. So would you like to share a little bit about that if you think, you know, because um, you and I, we've been in this field for some time now, and we know that there is always, you know, um, our folks are very educated. People that are HIV positive tend to know a lot about their body and what works and what doesn't work. So um, we always wanna make sure that our community is part of the conversation, right? Do you want to speak a little bit to it if you have anything to share? You know, I think it's this? really I think it's really important because since what 1996 when antivirals came out, uh, you know, before that they had the protease inhibitors that were causing a lot of people, you know, stress yeah. in their life and the 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 side effects alone. Uh, but even then, you know, when they came out, uh, a lot of people were worried about what if, what if this happens. You know, and then some people took it with stride and just took the medication, a lot of people, uh, but we're dealing with a lot of side effects, you know, and then new, newer medications came out, you know, they had the, uh, the cocktails all in one medication, but new variants of it came out from different companies. And, you know, I always, always tell somebody when they tell me which um, treatment they're on, it's like, oh my God, that's such an old treatment. Don't you want something better that's going to work? And sometimes I hear the response of, you know what, it's, it's not broken, why fix it? And I'm right. thinking, you know, the side effects that you're having that you mentioned to me, because you, you've been living with this for 15 years, and ever since you started your medications, you've had diarrhea probably, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, that's not normal. So let's talk about it, you know, with somebody, maybe we can have a diet change, or maybe these really aren't the right meds for you, even though your viral load is suppressed and your T-cell count is really high. Right. Um, yeah better quality of life for somebody living with HIV, I believe, is what I strive for. Um, and now with uh, the possibility in our lifetime to have this cure, just really, um, it, I mean, I'm astounded at it, actually. So true, Rafael. Thank you so much for that insight. I think a lot of people, for people, I'm sure people that are watching are also people, professionally, people that have been working in, in, in the HIV prevention <laughs> for quite some time or maybe not, but overall, uh, not many folks and, uh, know that the accessibility also to care, it's not available to everyone. So even in the US, less than 50% of people that have been diagnosed with HIV are not um, taking care of their medications regimen. They don't have access to it. In some states, it's really expensive. It's unapproachable. So we have, Half of the population, HIV population in America, they actually doesn't have access to medication. So that's why perhaps finding a cure is something that really brings a lot of hopes for everyone, not just those that have accessibility, but for everyone in the US and the rest of the world, hopefully. So, but anyway, um, without further ado, perhaps we should let the scientists and the doctors talk as well, right, Rafael? Yes, definitely. <laughs> and I want to hear more we're about so. It. <laughs> So we're so fortunate today. Um, my first uh, guest speaker is actually Dr. Lars Pache. Um, he's a research assistant professor in the, in the immunity and pathogenesis programs at the Sanford Birmingham Previous Medical Discovery Institute, which has organized the lecture today. His works focuses on, on pathogenic viruses, including HIV, influenza, and SARS-CoV-2. After receiving his undergraduate degree in biochemistry in Germany, Dr. Pache joined the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego as a graduate student and receiving his PhD in biology in collaboration with the Freie Universidad of Berlin, I hope I said that right, in Germany. There's way more to share of Dr. Lars, but I, without any further ado, uh, Doctor, I can see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Share my screen.
We can see it. You can Perfect. see it fine. All right, excellent. So um, I would say there are three important components of, of you know, to combat uh, HIV that, that we can talk about here. This prevention, uh, this treatment, and this ultimately a cure. Um, and that, while there have been a lot of progress recently reported, um, definitely on the treatment that Raphael has already talked about, more recently also on new drugs for, for the prevention of HIV, a cure has so far been, been uh, elusive. And so before we dive into that, let me begin by talking a little bit about what happens when HIV infects a cell. So HIV, sorry, technical problem here. Um, so HIV preferentially infects human T cells, which are an important component of the immune system. Infection and the destruction of these T cells uh, causes immune deficiency and eventually will lead to AIDS. Now, what is unique about HIV is that once the virus enters the cell, it inserts itself, it inserts its DNA permanently into the genome of the, of the host cell, into the genome of this human cell, and thereby uh, becomes a permanent reservoir. So the virus remains permanently in the cell. Once it is integrated, then the virus can either replicate, um, you know, produce new virions that then go on to infect other cells, or in certain cases, it can enter a dormant state. It's a, a sort of hibernation where the virus remains in the cell permanently, but temporarily does not replicate. So this state is called latency and it forms a permanent reservoir of HIV in the human body. Now, um, now, so we fortunately do have highly effective drugs that allow treatment, that allow an effective treatment of HIV infection at this time. However, a lifelong adherence to this treatment is absolutely critical. As you can see here in this graph, you know, upon infection with HIV, a high level of virus will start circulating in the blood until the point where these antiretroviral drug treatment starts. Um, at this time, the antiretroviral drugs will suppress viral replication and the level of virus in the blood will drop down completely. So at this time, typically um, no replication competent or no reproducing replicating virus can be detected in a person that is treated with these drugs and the person would be actually considered non-infectious. However, should this treatment be interrupted or stopped for any reason, the virus will rebound and start reproducing again, start circulating in the body as at levels um, just as you had before the treatment. And so this typically occurs within four to eight weeks after cessation of therapy. So it is absolutely critical that these, um, these drugs are being taken permanently. So that means while current drugs are pretty successful, are very successful at controlling an HIV infection, they do not provide a permanent cure. So now, why is it so difficult to cure an HIV infection rather than, than treating or controlling? And the reason for this lies in the dormant reservoir of you know, the virus that has, in, has integrated its own DNA into the cellular genome. Because these latently infected cells, once the virus is dormant, are indistinguishable from uninfected cells, meaning that the permanent reservoir is invisible to the immune system. These cells cannot be targeted, they cannot be found. So in order to target these cells and free the body from these infected cells, the virus would have to become visible. That means if this dormant virus can be activated, um, start reproducing again, then it may be possible to recognize and kill all the infected cells. And in order to do this, the so-called shock and kill or kick and kill concept was developed. So the idea behind this is that um, if you have an infected cell that carries the HIV genome in it, you will need a treatment with a latency reversing agent, a so-called shock in this treatment that stimulates the virus to start to become active again, to start replicating, to produce viral particles um, that are detectable on the cell. And by that, the cell can be identified, can become visible, and can be targeted for destruction in a second step, either by the body's uh, own immune system or by a second agent, by a second treatment that kills these, these cells. 
Now you could think that it may sound counterintuitive that you want to activate the virus if you're actually trying to combat it. it. It may sound dangerous. However, you need to consider that anyone who would undergo a treatment like this is also um, on therapy with antiretroviral drugs, meaning that even if these cells um, are reawakened, if the virus is reawakened um, due to the antiretroviral drugs, this virus cannot spread, it cannot infect any cells. The only thing that happens is that these cells become visible for destruction. So along this concept, our groups here at SPP have developed a method to successfully reactivate and awaken this dormant virus in infected cells, which would make it possible to, to target them. So we're ex very excited that um, we have developed here a novel drug that we call Ciapavir, um, that has been able in our lab experiments to successfully reactivate dormant virus in these infected cells and thereby making them a target for elimination. And so that means in a second step, then these reactivated cells that have been treated um, with this drug that we have developed can either be killed by the immune system or by an additional treatment to, um, to support the immune system in this. And these additional treatments are developed in parallel. So at this point, um, we are now looking to move forward from our lab studies um, to eventually move this towards clinical trials, to be able to test these, um, this, this new drug, this, this new treatment concept um, in a clinical trial. And that is something um, that Alison will talk a little bit about in a, in a minute about the, the next steps um, that, that are going to happen here that we're, we're planning on working on. So that's for my presentation. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you. This is very helpful. I think the first, I, I also appreciate you addressing the issue about reawakening the virus, right? Because from from those of us that are not scientists or doctors, just yeah. they, just to hear that it, it might seem very intimidating, and you know what kind of interference that will have in our body, in our health. So I really appreciate you going in depth about you know what the risk could be or not be actually in in regards to this. So. Just a quick question for you. I know this is just at the very beginning. Things could change as we move along with the research, but how um, uh, uh, how that will look like, an intervention of this kind? And people might wonder if it's just a pill that people will have to take. It's a regiment of intervention. What, what that will look like if we know that already? Yeah, so that is something that is something we are, we are also working on, right? Ideally, you would have a single treatment, a single pill or two that you take and you're rid of the virus. Um, it may not necessarily work that way. So we uh, could imagine that this is, you know, for a certain time, for a number of weeks or months, you would take a repeated treatment, maybe once a week or so. And uh, piece by piece, you're chipping away of this, on this viral reservoir. So you are uh, slowly depleting, depleting the viral reservoir to a point where ideally all the uh, remaining virus is gone or it has been decreased to a level um, where it can be controlled by, by the immune system. So ideally, the smaller the reservoir is, the, the lower the risks for, for a, a person living, living with HIV. And so the exact treatment uh, regimen, the exact type of treatment, that is something that the next steps will tell us that, that we are starting to work on now. That, that's, that's amazing. Um, so my own curiosity, what, would that be a difference between someone, let's say, you know, the research moves forward that we actually, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the science to, to, actually, um, to actually intervene. Would that be a difference between someone that's been taking retroviral drugs for many years versus someone that was newly diagnosed HIV positive and then never were submitted to medication? Is there a different evaluation about who will be able to have benefits from the intervention versus, oh, it, it would, oh that wouldn't matter. Um, I think generally it should not matter. Um, the ultimate goal will be to have your reservoir ideally disappear or at least as small as possible. So now with current treatments, the current treatment regimens, I mean, I'm not a medical doctor here, but I believe typically people now diagnosed with HIV will be put on antiretroviral treatments as early as possible, meaning you don't wait until the virus really spreads and has time to build a large reservoir. So my assumption is that someone who has been um, recently diagnosed and early on after diagnosis started treatment potentially has a, a smaller reservoir. So it may 
potentially this is speculation, but may, it may actually be easier to, to or faster to treat a person like this. Um, but um, on the other hand, someone who has been long on antiretroviral drugs successfully, the reservoir has also maybe depleted there. Um, we don't know. So the treatment should help, sh should help either one. Um, I don't think it would make a, a big difference. Right. Uh, and uh, thank you again. You know, these questions and concerns usually come from a community perspective, right? Because yeah, no, uh, there are so many approaches out there as well. I'm not a doctor. There are some people that would like to, that there is, a, uh, you know, anyone is HIV, newly HIV diagnosed. The idea is to encourage them to go under treatment right away without yeah. waiting for the T cells to drop. Others see it in a yeah. different way. So that's why I'm sure when the time will come, it will be a good problem to have yeah. to see exactly how, you know, to address this in population that are differently affected or infected by the virus. Yeah. So thank you, doctor. This is, uh, we're moving on with our next guest, but we're coming back to all together to have a conversation um, and, and to answer some questions. And just for the sake of clarity and housekeeping, this um, webinar has been uh, recorded. So for those of you that need to, a review or digest information that we're sharing today. Don't worry because everything will be recorded and shared with the participants. Um, our next guest is actually Dr. Allison Limpert. Uh, Dr. Allison received uh, her BA in microbiology from Ohio Wesleyan University and her PhD in neurosciences from Case Western Reserve University. She has 20 plus years of research experience in the biomedical sciences with A plus years focused on drug, drug discoveries. She currently works as a project manager um, of translational science within Sanford Bernard Previs, 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 sorry, and, um, and this in that designated cancer center under the directions of the deputy director, Dr. Nicholas Cosford. And there is plenty more about Dr. Allison, but without um, Limpert, without further ado, Allison. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you <laughs> Thanks so for much. Thanks for being with us. Let me share my screen. So as my colleague uh, Lars has described, our strategy for an HIV cure is to develop a drug that is gonna force HIV out of its hiding places in the cell so that it can be killed. And as Lars described, we have a compound that works in laboratory settings. We, we have something that is, is working for us uh, in the lab. And how do we take something that works in a laboratory assay and then develop that into a drug that patients can actually take? And so that's the, the side of drug development that um, I'm going to discuss with you today. Uh, let me see if I can forward. OK, great. Um, so basically how we develop a drug candidate is that we use a, a well-defined drug discovery process. And this uh, involves both preclinical studies, which we do here at SVP, as well as clinical studies, which will be done in a hospital setting. And preclinical drug discovery studies typically start with target identification and then move to compound discovery or a series of compounds that is discovered that hits that target. And then those compounds are tested in in vitro assays in, in the laboratory. These are cellular models of a disease. Uh, they can be done both in cell culture as well as in animals. So we have different models of disease states where we test our drugs. And so where we are now with um, our HIV drug is that we know what we are targeting. We have developed a, a compound that hits that target very effectively. And then we've tested our drug for efficacy in cellular and animal models and have found that this drug, this works. And uh, so basically we, we've um, completed these first three steps. And what we're looking for now is we need to see if this drug or this compound that we have developed is something that is safe for humans to take. And so that's, that's our basically our next step is to address the safety of this compound. And to get towards this, this safety question, we have a lot, of, a lot of questions we have to answer. And these are things like, how much drug would someone have to take for it to be effective? How often would they have to take this drug? Would this drug interact with any other drugs that that person might be taking? And also, how is that this drug 
can be metabolized by the body? And these are questions that we have to address with additional studies. And what if in the course of these additional studies, we find that the compound that we found to be so successful in the lab does have some liabilities? Well, you can imagine that our, um, the compound that we we're working with uh, looks like this molecule right here in the, the green and the blue. So what if we find this molecule, say, it interacts with more than our target. It interacts with multiple things in the cells and it might cause some sort of liability or side effect due to, due to that um, reactivity. Well, what we can do is we can very um, uh, proactively modify our chemical structure. You can see here in the cartoon, we added a, a, a subgroup to our compound here in purple. And we, we've added this to the molecule. So maybe this would provide additional selectivity. So we've made small meta chemical modifications to, our, to our, our scaffold or our drug in order to make it um, more tolerable to the body. Uh, alternatively, we could see a situation where our drug itself is not toxic to the body, but perhaps the body breaks it down to form a toxic byproduct or a metabolite. We could, again, make small chemical modification uh, here we see a, a different type of modification made in orange, maybe to a different part of our chemical scaffold. And this may force the body to break down the compound into different components, and therefore we would resolve that issue. And finally, you can imagine a scenario where our drug forces or, or causes a problem with the metabolic enzymes of the body. So the enzymes that would break down other drugs you're taking. And so this could obviously cause a toxic state. So again, our, our solution is to make small, very well-informed chemical modifications to our compound. So you can imagine uh, we would make a different modification to perhaps a different part of the structure. And through this process of iterative med medicinal chemistry of making just small modifications to our chemical scaffold or our chemical background, we can eventually come up with a compound that will uh, get around some of these liabilities. So, we are just dialing out any type of uh, toxicity or liability that we find as we continue to work with the compound and continue to analyze its safety profiles. And so uh, finally, um, what are our next steps with uh, this HIV drug that, that we have developed in the laboratory? And so where we are right now is we are determining the appropriate human dose and dosing strategy. So this is a combination of studies we will do as well as mathematical mod modeling using algorithms that can translate the studies we're doing in the lab to um, the human body. So those are some ongoing studies that we're working on. And, and through this process, we would be identifying any potential liabilities of our compound, um, trying to get an idea of what metabolites the, the human body would create uh, from our compound, trying to get ideas if there would be cross-reactivity with any um, metabolic enzymes in, in our bodies. So we're, we're identifying those liabilities. And as things show up or as we find something that doesn't work, we will make these small focused, educated um, chemical modifications uh, that will allow our drug um, to be accessible and, and be put into humans. So uh, that is the, the end of my uh, presentation uh, and I uh, welcome any questions. Dr. Limper, thank you so much. For those of us that are, uh, like me, that they were very visual, that's, that was very helpful to really break down the intervention and how the, the drug works. So that's really, Really, really welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I do see a question here that I would like to see if we we could we could respond now to that, or maybe later on when we do the Q and A. But Elliot Rodriguez was asking, how well does the drug works against highly drug resistant viruses? If we already know that. So I don't think we would know much about uh, the drug resistance. This is a, a kind of a totally different mechanism of, of treating the virus in which we would be um, trying to remove the virus from it, its reservoir. We're, we're trying to identify the infected cells so that the immune system or potentially a kill agent could kill those cells that are harboring the virus. So I'm not sure what is meant by, by the drug resistant viruses, um, if these are resistant um, to different uh, you know, antivirals or suppressant agents. Um, 
I would think that this uh, um, type of mechanism may get around some of those issues. Okay, and I think you, uh, I don't mean to interpret what uh, Rodriguez, Ali Rodriguez was saying, but I think you might have answered that because it was also a question of mine to think about well, in serving the population here in, in the area where we are working as a community center, we do have individuals that they are, um, you know, have issues with their resistance to drugs. They pretty much, they are, you know, they can't take any anti antiretroviral. So um, I'm guessing that could have gone in that direction. It's about concerns about for those people that already have um, you know, issues with the previous regimental drugs. So, but it, what you're saying, if I understood properly, it's a total different approach, right? It's not the same way of intervening as we did before. Yes. Um, thank you. And there is another question since they are there, I'll, I'll, we'll try to answer. There is another question in regards to if it was tested already in humanized models. I don't believe it was, or was it? We have not, well, we have tested either test tested it in humanized mouse models, yes. Okay, and thank you for answering that. And then I, another one, are you planning to include our cancer patients populations at this advances to human clinical trials? Um, I'm a little uh, confused about the cancer patient uh, mention. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by, by the, the cancer right. patient population. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll can ask them if they can reformulate that, but it, the way it came, I just read it the way okay. it's presented to us. Um, one question for me, um, I know there is a lot of conversation about vaccine, the general population might not understand perhaps the difference between a vaccine, a cure for HIV. It, it, in what we know so far and the research has been done, could that be possible that this research will lead us to the discovery of possible vaccine that might be having an intervention similar to the past viruses that we have addressed or not? No, I, I think this is completely yes. separate from a vaccine. This would yeah. be more of a cure, um, whereas a vaccine um, would be a prevent prevention. And I, I think there'd be completely different um, chemical matters or biological matters, yes. That's wonderful. And then we have actually a million dollar questions where um, we have someone asking Berkman, Candace Berkman, do you have the funding to see this through and what timeline is there until this is ready for patients? Which is obviously is everyone wants to know about so, the, the long term, right? How long it's going to take before the research goes forward? Yeah. So um, yes, we've been funded by NIH uh, grants. Uh, obviously this work has been done with support um, through NIH grants. We are currently submitting or in the process of submitting and having grants under review to continue this work. Um, so that that is the funding for it currently. Um, but yes, uh, the timeline, um, it, it, it sometimes can be hard to predict because it depends on what kind of roadblocks we run into as we go through this drug development process. So um, it depends on how many times we, we uh, need to, to go back to the drawing board uh, or to, to modify our compound to test it in, in the various different models that it would need before going through um, IND enabling and FTA studies. Um, so, so it can take quite a while. Uh, our estimate, I think we were talking would be uh, five or 10 years before a, a clinical trial would be something we could um, initiate. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Anything else that you would like to share with us that perhaps we haven't asked you, uh, maybe some misconceptions about the research. I'm sure, you know, a lot of questions will come through, uh, you know, as you do the research with the team, but any anything that you would like to share that you think it's important for the public to know? I think- Or the I audience today. It's important to know that um, you know we we are working on this and that we we definitely um, are, are looking for a cure for, for individuals suffering from 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 this and that we you know we care very deeply and we are invested in in this project. That's thank you thank you so much and um, at this time perhaps we can have all the panels panelists coming together even with uh, Dr. Pache and Raphael. Um, so, and I would like to see if there are any other questions, observations and what has been said so far. Raphael, do you have any questions? Well, I did, but I think all my questions have been answered. Some of the community <laughs> members asked some really good questions. 
No, I, you know, I think the question uh, that I had was for Dr. Lars and finding about, you know, uh, participants for clinical trials, when, when it might start, I guess they already said that about, you know, anywhere from five to 10 years, but um, who would be a good participant for this? Is it somebody who's virologically suppressed? Is it somebody that has a viral load? Is it somebody who's a, uh, um, uh, has had HIV for you know a number of years, a long-term survivor, uh, maybe new, newly diagnosed patients, uh, and uh, if so, is is having an other a secondary chronic illness a factor in that matter? Yeah, that that that's a good question. Um, so I think uh, what what would be important for this treatment is that uh, that the person is as well suppressed that you do not have a detectable viral load. Um, and that, uh, you know, adherence to, to the R treatment um, has been possible for a time because as I showed, you know, you're looking to reactivate the virus. Um, if you already have a, a viral load in the body or if, you know, you're not unable to follow a strict art regimen, um, this could potentially uh, be dangerous, right? You, you may expose yourself to an increased infection. So you definitely want um, uh, an increased viral load. Um, when it comes to whether it's about you know newly detected uh, people or people who are long-term survivors, um, I think that will be up to um, to uh, the, the medical doctors planning a clinical trial to determine what what that would be um, optimal. Um, I personally, at this point, do not necessarily see a, a reason to prefer one over the other. I think all of these cases um, could be could be suitable. When it comes to um, clinical trial, including people with, with, with other um, severe illnesses, um, cancer, I think there were a couple of questions about cancer. Um, I think when it comes to these early stage clinical trials, what you need to do is to really um, observe or, or look at this uh, treatment in isolation. So for a number of reasons, also, as Alison said, you need to consider interactions with other drugs that someone treated for cancer may be taking. Um, the first trials are typically with someone who does not suffer from um, or who does not need medication for other severe diseases. Um, uh, that is, you know, uh, just a basic safety safety measure. Again, this would be up to a doctor to to decide. But um, from what I know, typically the at least the first studies, the initial studies, will be focused um, on a person that is otherwise healthy beyond uh, the the HIV infection. However, um, it is true that an, uh, you know a large population of people living with HIV may suffer from cancer, so there will definitely be in the future probably clinical trials that 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 are going to to look at that too. But um, again, a medical expert would be better to answer that question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Maybe. Thank you, doctor. Maybe maybe that question also was you just maybe answered that question. It was rephrased in regards mm -hmm. to a cancer patient. Genesis Blanco is rephrasing the question, saying, we have many cancer patients in my institutions that happen to be HIV positive. Do you plan to have a, a human clinical trial that may include cancer patients? From what you just shared with us, it looks like you're pretty much answering that question. Am I correct? Yeah, typically because, you know, there's a large diversity. Every cancer patient may, you know, be under a different drug treatment or so. And, and you know, just for safety measures alone, um, you, you would need to consider those. So for that reason, typically the first trials would be um, with persons um, who are HIV positive, but not necessarily uh, uh, under treatment for, for, for cancer. Um, that may be something for, for, the, for the next step. Dr. Lars, I had a quick question. Is yep. uh, mental health medication considered, uh, been taken into consideration into this? Um, I don't think I can answer that question. That is really um, something that a pharmacologist um, probably or someone specialized on these trials would, would need to answer. I mean, not every uh, a drug uh, would right. interfere, but again, this is really a pharmacological question. Okay. Thank you so much. We would do um, initial screening to see if our, our compound would have a predicted drug-drug interaction. And so that could give us information on to which other drugs people could safely be on when they took this drug. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Yeah. Great. Um, Maybe, mm -hmm. sorry, Max, if I can just, um, uh, before Please, we move ahead. on to, to the next question, I just wanted to briefly come back to the question from Elliot Rodriguez earlier um, about the highly drug-resistant viruses. Um, because that, that is definitely a problem um, for, for people, you know, 
living with HIV, also long-term survivors. Um, so we actually, in this case, I would not necessarily expect that uh, drug resistance would be um, a concern for this particular treatment. Antiretroviral drugs target the virus itself. So you have a, a, a medical compound that uh, binds or, or inhibits um, a part of the virus itself. And we know that the virus can mutate very fast and, and uh, adapt to a drug. What our drug is doing, it is not targeting the virus. The, our drug binds to a component in the cell itself, in the human cell. So it stimulates um, a signal in the cell. And while the virus can, um, can mutate fast, the, the human cell cannot. So the, the, the molecule that our drug binds is a, a molecule in the human cell that should not uh, be affected by this drug resistance quickly. So we are stimulating the cell, not the virus here. Interesting. Thank you. That I'm sure that's been helpful. Um, on the note of cancer patients, we have another question that goes on the same thread as the one before. Um, and the question from Ian Snyder says, will this approach be considered able to be given in patients treated with cytotoxic therapies or immunotherapies such as those given in cancer treatments? This is connecting to the questions that we were addressing before about cancer, but it looked, yeah. Yeah, again, that is probably a question that would need to be answered by a pharmacologist, um, uh, you know, depending on, on the specific therapy here, right? So ideally, the, the, the treatments we are looking for is not a permanent long-term treatment that you have to take over and over and over again. It is something that, you know, uh, would, be, would be taken or, or pursued for, for a defined amount of time. So, you know, one could see if, you know, if, if, how this would fit in, in a treatment schedule with, with other drugs. But again, this is a, a question for a medical doctor, a pharmacologist. And uh, Dr. Lars, I had a quick question. Is uh, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to like hepatitis C treatment is now uh, somebody can get reinfected with hepatitis C. Is this something you foresee with uh, the HIV treatment, you know, uh, actually being freed from it and then possibly being reinfected from it? Oh, definitely. Yes. Uh, this, this, this kind of cure treatment would, I, you know, the plan is to free you from the virus. But um, after that, you would be, you know, essentially as susceptible to the virus as before. This is where, you know, prevention treatments such as, you know, uh, PrEP treatments um, would, would be helpful or uh, ideally a vaccine. You know, uh, there are other um, efforts to develop vaccines that are, you know, targeting prevention rather than treatment. So, um, you know, precautions would still be necessary, yes. Thank you. That's really important. Thanks for asking that, Rafael, because obviously uh, it's uh, in, in a process of, of you know, uh, looking at the science also, we're concerned about the community and how the community has access and how the behavioral also, right? Mm -hmm. And the concerns about community members. And um, in the past few years, a lot of uh, progress has been made just with PrEP. As a community center, we have been referring to our patients that are not HIV positive, the use of PrEP, also, you know, of finding out how much they uh, the medications are actually preventing the spread of HIV from a, a person that is infected with HIV to one that is not. So there is really zero risks uh, when someone is under care. So there is a lot of preventing methods right now, but definitely the cure is what, you know, lift our souls and, and makes us hope for better in, 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 in the future. So we really appreciate you all working on this. Um, let me see if there are any other questions from the public. I believe, um, I don't know if these questions, what it means, obviously I'm not a doctor, is it, is it working for all mutants? I think maybe yeah, all so strains. Yeah, I think that goes back to the, the different strains of HIV, different mutants of, of HIV. Um, again, this would obviously need to be tested, but um, looking at the concept of this, as I mentioned before, that where we are targeting um, the, the cell, the infected cell, and not the virus directly, um, we would expect from our data so far that it should be working for all mutants. Um, obviously, there can be clinical differences. Um, I don't believe that is known. That would need to be tested. But at this point, we have reason to believe um, that it would be fairly universal. That's great. That's great. I think for once, it's good to know that 
um, I'm, I'm really excited also to be part of this conversation today because um, for, a, for a, an institute like yours, taking the right steps to also inform the community and make sure that we are part of the process in the conversation, right? Even the conversation yeah, we're having today, I think yeah. it's really important because in many, many years ago for, I don't know, for those of us that uh, were, were there, you know, our relationships, the LGBTQ community relationship with the scientists and research wasn't so, you know, um, uh, normal for lack of a better word. We had to impose this research. We had to make sure that drugs was found that, you know, the whole act, the history of ACT UP in our LGBT movement that brought the science to do research and has changed the relationship between the community and also the, the um, in, you know, research process. So we're really looking forward to yeah. create more moments like this where the community can actually share the inputs, the concerns, once the yeah. drug will be out, right? That, <laughs> that will be something that we're looking forward to and a good bridge to cross when the time yeah. comes. Well, actually, um, Max, that's, um, th yes. that input I think is highly valuable. And I think we don't need to necessarily wait until a, a drug is out on the market, right? And it's actually a question I, I would like to ask, maybe maybe Raphael can, can say something about that. Um, I mean, we have been discussing this previously, but I think that's an, it's an, an important point. I mean, we have good antiretroviral drugs. So most people, you know, you would think if you read about this, most people who take these drugs are have a well-controlled infection, undetectable viral levels. Um, why, why, why do you need a cure, right? I mean, a cure is another treatment. Any treatment comes with certain risks. Why, you know, if you have these, you know, highly active antiretroviral drugs, why would you, why would you want a, a treatment, right? And that is also a question to the community. Are people in the community um, uh, interested in this in this cure, or would would people say, oh, you know, I'm so happy, or I'm, I'm satisfied with with the current treatment that this is unnecessary and i believe it is necessary but i think you know rafael or people from the community i think that your input would be very interesting there thank you uh, you know i think um for myself if that question was asked i would actually um have a few items to say about it the, number one it's some of the side effects that do come with having hiv having the antivirals being taken on a daily basis and they've been instilled in us to take them on a daily basis every day at the same time within two to three hours. And um, some people really freak out when they don't have their meds. If they forget them, if they were you know, misplaced for the couple of days uh, and it's, it's, it really affects them uh, and, and their body in a way that it really messes them up until you educate them, of course, you know, it's okay. Your viral load is, isn't gonna go to a point where, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, counted and it's going to do any damage to your body, but it still messes with people. Uh, for myself, I think um, not having to, that whole disclosure thing, to be honest, is just, it's, 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 um, it's kind of um, for, for, for younger people, not even for myself, you know, but for younger people, the disclosing to family members, partners, future partners, ex-partners, you know, it has a toll on them. Um, um, just because it, it really messes with them. And I see it on a daily basis, you know, I do a lot of counseling around it. You know, how would you like to be told? How would you, how would you react or, on this situation? And, you know, and every time uh, I hear people, God, if, if this was one thing I didn't have to do, that would be great. You know, and I, I, I tell them I agree, you know, uh, having to disclose, you know, every single time uh, to your partners uh, is pretty horrendous. I, I thanks Rafa for sharing that. I think also in collecting the stories of the hundreds of people that we serve, we'll also hear that a lot of, despite the progress and despite the fact that we're in 2021, even a lot of service providers, unless they are HIV specialists, they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know where research has, how far has gone. So if you even go to a general doctor, sometimes they haven't been able to know what PrEP is about or what HIV medications are interacting with your body. It, it, it's just problematic because now, once again, the patient has to educate the doctor about uh, what this is about and how to prevent it and, and, and you know why the side effects are what, what they are. And not everyone in the U.S. has, has the ability to have I don't know, like their own clinics in here in San Diego, specialized providers that are at the forefront of medications. Many people live in rural areas where a diagnosis of HIV could be, could be 
really devastating. And, and now you become the disease, right? You're not a person with HIV. Now you become an HIV person. And, and it's really troubling. And so I think the cure goes into the destigmatizing also the fact that this is not uh, just affecting LGBT people. As we know, around the world, the majority of people are not actually LGBT people that have been affected by HIV is the opposite. Um, and then also the lack of accessibility. I think the fact that people cannot have access to medications. Rafael was saying, you know, the, the daily regiment is not, it's not, a, a, it's a luxury for a lot of people that they can have that stability in their lives to be able to have access to medication. We have people actually storing their medication here at our community center because they don't want to come out to their families or their, you know, or the people they're close to just because you know, the presence of medication will do so. So it's, there are millions of dynamics that sometimes folks don't take in consideration, including the stigma and the, and, 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 and the, the way people move around the conversation around being HIV positive. So um, I think, yeah, I, 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 you know, from the days I was there when this monster came into our lives and, and at the time was the gay cancer, as they used to call it at the time. And, and what we went through in the past 35 years, it just even having this conversation, it's, it's very, um, you know, uplifting. Uh, just even the idea that someone is working on the cure, it, it, it really will cause so much, you know, uh, reassurance among our communities. I'm sure about that. So yeah, yeah, much more. I'm, I don't see any, uh, if let me check. Oh no, there are other questions, I'm sorry. I didn't scroll down. Um, um, well, there's a lot of kudos to, to the doctors and researchers for doing what you do. Um, and then we have, um, they say when someone is on PrEP, they still have to take that medication every day. So uh, even if it's someone was cured from HIV, wouldn't they still need to be on the daily PrEP regimen? I think we, yeah. we answered that question. You know, PrEP is a choice, by the way. It's not that they had to, I mean, you know, um, in our community, the conversation around PrEP are really destigmatized because there is that concept that only overly active people should take PrEP, but when in reality, you know, sometimes it takes only once, right? So it's not about the frequency of your interactions. It's more about, you know, what, how safe you want to be in taking a medication will prevent, you know, uh, the spread of HIV. Um, so it's really a personal um, choice. But um, I would say everyone that doesn't have HIV, at least here at the center, straight or not, we always advise them, hey, you have an opportunity to prevent the spread of HIV. You should consider going out and prep if you can, if your uh, insurance covers it and, and so forth. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Any other comments or... Uh, concerns or uplifting words from any of the doctors, um, if you would like to share, and you don't have to, <laughs> but Max, I'm I sure the research is quite, it's quite intense. Yes, Rafael. Max, I'm sorry, I have a little, quick little thing. Just, uh, just because somebody Please. doesn't have insurance doesn't mean they can't get PrEP. Uh, there are, yes. there are, you know, uh, ADAP right. that will cover people that are negative to get on PrEP and to actually give them the meds uh, free of charge. Uh, same Thank thing you. with the pharmaceutical companies. They're more than willing to give those out. Thank you, Rafael. It, it, in some states, that's true. I, I don't know who is logging in today in this webinar. In some states, definitely in the state of California and many others, that's the case because we we advocated for, for that coverage for many years. In other states, that's not the case. But yeah, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's important that people know that they might have access to it. So if you don't know, reach out to us at the LGBT centers they will connect you to care if you need to, if you're in California. And I, um, I also wanted to mention, there was one more question from Raju about how many different mutations are there? Uh, and that would go probably to Lars, the question. Oh, I thought that's, that was an old one. Thank you, Rafael. Yeah, Thanks yeah. a lot. Is any, anyone from, yeah, maybe Dr. Lars, if you would like Sorry. to answer that. Uh, the question was how many mutants are oh. there? I mean, HIV, yeah. Yeah, essentially for for um, for HIV, there's an infinite num in, infinite number of, of, of mutants there. Um, you know, you, you're here for you know SARS-CoV-2, COVID. Now you know a new mutant has popped up here or there. 
Um, HIV, in terms of mutation, is, is on, a, on an entirely different level. Um, it, it mutates extremely fast. You know, everybody has many, many different mutants, different versions in, in your body. It's just some that are more successful in spreading than others. Um, certain mutations uh, develop, but um, there's no number I can put, put on it. Um, there are a lot. Um, I think it's not the individual mutants that counts, but rather which drugs the mutants, the different mutants are, are resistant um, against. And there are probably, um, you know, for each, for almost each drug that exists, there is probably a, a, a mutant. Um, yeah. So it is the combination of drugs that helps we'll there, go. but there's not a clear answer to that question. So the thing is right. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Um, I see there is a, another question from uh, uh, Kais. Um, there is a personal experience that Kais is sharing about the adoption of a more um, alternative therapy. Um, uh, but at the same time, they're asking, um, if you're a private company, what's your investor's model? Will, will more funding and, or large investment speed up the process? Yeah, so I mean, for the first part, I believe that is something that really needs to be discussed on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the doctor. That is something I, I, I cannot speak to. Um, right. You know, you want to make sure that your doctor is from the point of diagnosis aware of, of your situation and can find the best treatment for you. So that is something that I believe is, is really important. Um, there was a comment about novel drugs, injectables once once every 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 two months. So right. these kind of long-term drugs are being developed for treatment. So they will not provide a cure, but it will relieve people from having to take medications every day. So these, these, um, these drugs are, are being developed. Um, actually, we have a bit of feedback here. Um, so, so that is something. And, and in terms of finance, so we are a, a, a private nonprofit research institute. So most of our, or a large part of our research is funded either by NIH or, or by, private, by private donations here. So for a project like this, um, so to get to the point where we are, this, um, this has been largely funded by a grant from, from NIH. Um, to move forward eventually, um, you know, we will need to partner with an entity that can conduct clinical trials, right? right? These are like very, um, very expensive, very, very large efforts. Um, mm -hmm. The stage where we are at now, and Alison um, talked a bit about the details, is to prepare everything that could move arts towards a clinical trial to show that our drug is safe. And once we have demonstrated that it's safe, that it works in our model system, that is the data that you know a, a larger company would need to uh, promote this to um, or to to move this forward to a clinical trial. So at this point, you know, um, we cannot you know uh, from you know in the in the next couple of weeks uh, identify funding to conduct a clinical trial. That is not possible. But um, what we are doing is we are you know applying for for grants from NIH from from other donors. To get these, um, you know, smaller amounts that allow us to do these studies, these stepwise studies to move us forward, that Allison has, has alluded to, um, that will then allow this to become um, a, a, a viable candidate for for the clinical trials, which will be conducted by by industry. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. That was very uh, exhaustive. I mean, really gave us the idea about you know how the bigger pictures about funding and everything else. Well, it looks like we answered all the questions that were presented to us so far. Um, unless there are any, any other questions, I would like to close this conversation on time. It's three o'clock right now, so the, hour, um, the people that are watching uh, knew that was going to be an hour conversation, but we know this is just the beginning. I know that as the process and research will move forward, We'll definitely be interested in coming back and see where we are and the ch new challenges perhaps presented and new conversation around the research. So I thank you all of you for being here today, uh, Dr. Pak and then Dr. Limpert and Rafael Rubalcava. Um, it's been a pleasure and honor to, to be here with you all and looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max. Have a yeah, good one. Thank you, you so much. You.